We are in the middle of this series, uh, The Reason for God, Conversations on Faith and Life. Uh, it is a series looking at the common objections to the Christian faith, reasonable doubts, if you like. And uh, it's based on this book uh, by Tim Keller, The Reason for God, Belief in an Age of Skepticism. Uh, and if you haven't read it, I'd encourage you uh, to read it. Uh, and uh, even if you don't particularly want to read it, I encourage you to buy it and then give it to a friend of yours who you think might like to read it. Uh, so do, uh, do buy one of those from Amazon. Today we're looking at what about choice, and uh, by that I'm, I really mean uh, the protest against the Christian belief in absolute truth. What about choice? How can you believe in absolute truth? Doesn't it undermine freedom? both the freedom of others and the freedom of those who believe in the absolute truth. So isn't it oppressive to believe in absolute truth, to impose your views on others? Doesn't that limit the freedom of others? Isn't it culturally narrow? But is it also suppressive in that uh, it puts a burden on those who believe in absolute truth? Doesn't it restrict our own freedom as Christians? Doesn't it enslave, even infantilize believers? Uh, a questionnaire a survey was done about uh, this very issue, and they spoke to an artist called Chloe, and she said this in response. She said, the Christians I know don't seem to have the freedom to think for themselves. And I think that's because in our culture, there is a particular definition of freedom. And that is that we are, freedom means choosing your own truth. Choosing what is right and what is wrong. Freedom means choice in our culture. And it's an incredibly prevalent idea. It's a powerful idea. It shaped the agenda, the political agenda of New Labour, both under Tony Blair and under Gordon Brown. It was all about choice. Remarkably, it is built into U.S. law. This is what the U.S. Supreme Court says about freedom or liberty. The heart of liberty is to define one's own concept of existence, of the meaning of the universe. That's remarkable, isn't it? Notice it doesn't say to discover one's own concept of existence. It says to define one's own concept of existence, of the meaning of the universe. And so we find our culture asking this question of the church, what about choice? Isn't Christianity and its belief in absolute truth a straitjacket? How might we respond to that in a few moments this morning? Well, three things I want us to touch on. The first is that truth is more important than you think it is. The second is that freedom is more complex than you think it is. And then thirdly, Jesus is more liberating than you think he is. So let's start with the first one. Truth is more important than you think. Do you have the passage open in front of you, if you would. Uh, it's on... Um, where is it? It's page 1103 in your pew Bibles. We're going to kind of use it as a springboard into the issue. Um, and what it's recounting is an early church debate. You may not know, but the first generation of Christians were Jewish by background. And they kept the ceremonial laws of Judaism and they met in the temple. And then you had a second generation of Christian converts uh, from those who were not Jews. Uh, what the Bible calls Gentiles. And so the question arose, did these Gentile converts need to become Jews first in order to be disciples of Jesus? Or was the law, the ceremonial law, so fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ that it actually became obsolete? And Paul said, yes. The law was so fulfilled in Christ that it was obsolete. The Gentiles were free from the law. And the New Testament tells us that the Council of Jerusalem, where all the leaders of the early church came together to decide whether that was true or not, decided with Paul. Paul wins the argument. And so you look at verse 4 and 5 and he says this. That we have freedom in Christ... And it is the truth of the gospel 
that preserves it. So we have freedom in Christ because of the gospel, because of the truth. Can that be right, do you think? There's this relationship between truth and freedom. Paul says that we can be free because of the truth, that freedom comes from the truth. And that's very much the opposite, isn't it, of what our culture teaches us to think, where we say that freedom is freedom from the truth. So why does our culture think that? Well, actually, it's because of a very influential school of philosophy centered around two individuals. Uh, You may have heard of neither of them, but you will know how they think because your thinking will have been influenced by theirs. The first is the 19th century German philosopher, Friedrich uh, Nietzsche, and the second is his disciple, a 20th century French philosopher called Michel Foucault. And their uh, belief was that, or their claim was that all truth claims are always power plays. All truth claims are methods of control. So what they did, they would essentially question your motivation when you make a truth claim. Somebody described it as philosophical squinting. So say you were to say, I think everybody should be passionate about social justice and equality. Nietzsche, in German, would go, hmm, he'd squint at you, hmm, rub his chin. Do you really think everybody should be passionate about social justice, he would ask, or do you want to lead a revolution that would put you in power? He'd question your motivation. Now, you might be surprised to hear this from me as a minister in the Church of England, but I agree with them. Nietzsche and Foucault on this issue were right. Surprise. And I think that because that's exactly what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees. And let's be honest with ourselves. When Nietzsche, Foucault, and Jesus agree, then it must be right. So what I think we can say is that truth claims in general are power plays. But not all truth claims are power plays all the time. Not all truth claims are power plays all the time. Listen to the words of C.S. Lewis from his little booklet, uh, The Abolition of Man. He says this, You cannot go on explaining away forever. You will find you have explained away explanation itself. You cannot go on seeing through things forever. The whole point of seeing through something is to see something through it. It is good that the window should be transparent because the street or garden beyond it is opaque. opaque. How if you saw through the garden too? A wholly transparent world is an invisible world. To see through all things is the same as not to see. So to say that all truth claims are always power plays is itself a truth claim and therefore a power play. And you've explained away your explanation. You see, to see through everything is not really to see anything at all. And if I may be so bold as to say, the truth is, we all make truth claims. We have to. So making a truth claim doesn't necessarily lead to oppression. It's the truth that is claimed that leads to oppression. Let me give you an example. You may remember about five years ago, a man called Charles Roberts uh, in Lancaster County in Pennsylvania walks into a junior school and he takes out his gun and he shoots dead five young girls and then he kills himself. Do you remember that? And the community forgave him for that terrible crime, those awful murders. And his family, who was left in the community after he'd killed himself, they cared for his mother. They went around to visit her, to look after her. They gave her money to support her because she was dependent on her son, who'd killed himself after these, after these shootings. And now this community was an Amish community. 
Now, t- by anybody's definition, the Amish are fundamentalists, aren't they? They believe in absolute truth, and they believe that they have that absolute truth. But doesn't fundamentalism lead to violence and oppression? That's what our culture tells us. But why not in this particular example? It's because their absolute truth was a man who died on the cross, who said, Father, forgive them, who called on his disciples to forgive our enemies. And so their absolute truth wasn't a power play. It didn't lead to oppression and violence. You see, not all truth claims are power plays. And it means that we can be free and we can believe in absolute truth. In fact, I want to take us one step further than that and say, actually, if we want to be free, we have to believe the truth. We can't know freedom without the truth. Jesus said it, didn't he? The truth will set you free. What does that mean? Well, we've looked at truth is more important than you think. Let's look at the second point, that freedom is more complex than you think. Back to the passage with me, if you would. Um, Paul has had his mission affirmed. The Gentiles are free from the law. And then in verse 10, look with me, he says, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. So verse 4, Paul says, you're free from the law. And then... Well, actually, you're restricted to the biblical, ethical norms. You're free, and you're restricted. Doesn't that clash with our modern definition of freedom? Our culture, if you think about it, defines freedom negatively, doesn't it? It, It's the absence of constrictions or restraint, the absence of boundaries. It's the freedom to choose I don't know if you've seen the movie I, Robot. It came out a few years ago starring Will Smith. The hero, though, is Sonny, and Sonny is a robot. And he was built with a particular purpose, and that purpose was to thwart a robot rebellion. And he was successful. He accomplished his mission. The robot rebellion was quashed. And there's this discussion at the end of the movie between Sonny, the hero, and... Will Smith's character, Detective Spooner. This is how it goes. Sonny says to Detective Spooner, now that I've fulfilled my purpose, I don't know what to do. And Detective Spooner says, I guess you'll have to find your way like the rest of us, Sonny. That's what it means to be free. The scriptwriter there has enshrined the modern understanding of freedom. What he says is if we live by divine directives or commands, we're no better than robots. We've been dehumanized. To be free is to create your own purpose, to create your own truth. But surely that's an oversimplification. Surely freedom is more complex than that. Think about eating. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we were all free to eat whatever we liked? All the time. But the truth is, if we want the freedom of a healthy long life, we have to restrict ourselves and eat only healthy food. Or think about music. I thoroughly enjoyed the band this morning. I thought you were brilliant, on form. I can't play like that. I wish I had the freedom to express myself, to perform in that way, to be free. But to be able to do that, I would need to restrict myself to hours and hours of practice. I don't really have the discipline to do that. You see, discipline can release you into greater freedom. But discipline isn't a good in and of itself. So freedom isn't discipline. Let me give you an example. Sport is always a good example, I think. Um, I have a friend uh, who loved rowing. My mic's gone funny, is it? Hang on, let me slip it back. There we go. Um, And 
he was incredibly disciplined, incredibly fit. He was able to get up at five o'clock in the morning and uh, he did all the weights and all the exercise. He was a fantastic rower, technically, but he was five foot four. He was short. And so he could never attain the standard that he wanted to attain. He could never row in the first boat. He just couldn't do it because he was too short. He was in the wrong sport. It was the wrong fit for him. So if any teacher has ever said to you, or you're ever tempted to say to anybody, you can do whatever you want to do in your life, that is wrong. Don't say it. Don't believe it. So what is freedom then? Well, freedom, it's not the absence of restriction. It's not the presence of restriction either. Freedom is found in the presence of the right restrictions. Those that reflect and fit who we are, who you're made to be. You think about the fish in the fishbowl. And you look at it and you think, that's so restricted. He needs... I need to set him free. And you put your hand in the fishbowl, pull it out and throw the fish into the great freedom of the field. And it lies there flapping. That's not freedom, is it? It's the opposite. The fish needs the water. It needs to be restricted to the water if it is to be free, if it is to flourish. That's the absolute truth. Perhaps the greatest example for us is love. Love brings freedom. It brings security, fulfillment, and joy. Human beings are made to love and to receive love. That's our ultimate fit. That's absolute truth, if you like. But the freedom that love brings only comes if you surrender your individual freedom. My wife, Joanne, and I have been married for 13 years, 14 in September. And uh, I still remember the first time I came home late. And I hadn't told her because I was not really thinking that way. And uh, there she was, big eyes, red, teary, looking at me. Where have you been? She thought I'd been murdered. And I realized, okay, I'm not going to be able to make any more unilateral decisions in my life because I love my wife and she loves me. And that's what I realized freedom was. So freedom requires the presence of the right restrictions, the right, those that fit. But who is to say who you are? Who is to say This is who you were made to be. You've got to remember Nietzsche and Foucault. You've got to take them seriously because they agreed with Jesus, so they must be right. So how can we find out who we are made to be without that being a power play, without me saying to you, this is who you were made to be, and exercising power and authority over you? So what we've seen is truth is more important than you think. It isn't always a power play. Freedom is more complex than you think. It isn't choice, it's being who you were made to be, but then we're left with this question, isn't that a power play? And that's where we come to our third point, that Jesus is more liberating than you think. You see, this wrestle to define freedom is part of an ancient debate that has been going on for thousands of years. It's nothing new. The Greek philosophers had two schools of thought around it. You had the traditionalists who said, yes, There is a way that we are all meant to be. There is a reason for life, for existence. Just like the fish has his water, human beings, creation as a whole, has something. But they could not work out what it was. And so you had this second school of skeptics who arose saying, no, 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 no. There isn't that reason for life. Just like Detective Spooner. And that's the debate, isn't it, that's still going on. And we seem to be at this impasse. So how can we break through it? Well, it's to realize that Jesus is more liberating than you think. You see, the Greeks had a 
uh, a technical philosophical term for this reason for life. They called it the logos. That's what they were looking for, the rationality of the universe, uh, the word. And the Apostle John, one of the earliest followers of Jesus, stepped into that debate, into the debate we're discussing today. And when he wrote his biography of Jesus, he said this right at the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, was the Logos. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. So far, so good. The Greek philosophers could have gone with that. And then he says something that nobody else had ever said before in the history of human, of humanity. He says, and the Logos, this rationality of the universe, became flesh. He became a human being and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Wow. What John was saying is that the Logos, the reason for life, is an absolute person, not an absolute principle. In response to the skeptics, he says, there is a Logos, there is a reason for life. Freedom isn't choice. But in response to the traditionalists, he says, this reason for life, this absolute truth, is not an abstract truth. It's not a divine directive or command to comply with. You see, truth, it isn't a power play. What he says instead is, we have seen his glory. Absolute truth isn't an abstraction, it's a person. This is what we're made for. We're made for him, to love him, to serve him, to know him, to enjoy him. Now that is a philosophical bombshell, isn't it? It makes all the difference in the world. You see, if truth is an abstraction, then it is a power play. It does restrict our freedom. It is dehumanizing. But if it is a person to be loved, it's liberating. Just think about love again for a moment. For a relationship of love to work, both people must surrender their independence together. If only one person does it, then it goes wrong, doesn't it? You find that there's exploitation. And Foucault and Nietzsche and probably even Detective Spooner, they all think that a relationship with God is by definition one way and therefore it is by definition dehumanizing. So God gives the Ten Commandments. Religion is about following rules and abstractions. It's based on fear. It's exploitative. But that is not the God of the Bible. That is not the God that Christians know and love. Just flick back to the passage in Galatians 2 and look at uh, verses 11 to 13 and I'll try and just kind of illustrate how this works out in practice. Peter has slipped back into uh, racist habits because he's afraid of those, uh, the, the Jewish party around him. And, uh, and Paul challenges him on his racism but what he doesn't say is, Peter... You've forgotten rule number 17b that says you should not be a racist. That would just be an abstraction. Instead, look at verse 14. He says, When I saw they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, He calls Peter to live in line with the truth of the gospel. And the truth of the gospel is this. You are loved unconditionally by a person. Because of the sheer grace of God, he's reached out to us in the person of his son on the cross so that we might know forgiveness and freedom as he took upon himself all the wrongdoing in the world and absorbed it into his body and dealt with it right there. And he says to Peter, because that has happened, because God has done that for you, You don't have to be bound by fear. You don't have to be enslaved by your old habits. You can be free. You can be free. You see, Christians believe that absolute truth became a person. A person who gave up his independence and his freedom on the cross. A person who was exploited by us. 
The ultimate free being gave up his freedom. He was bound. He was nailed to the cross so that you can know that you really can trust him. He has made himself vulnerable. He has surrendered his freedom. Will you do the same? Because if you do, you will discover true liberation. You will discover what freedom really means. And so just to wrap up, truth is more important than you think. It isn't always a power play. Freedom is more complex than you think. It isn't choice. But Jesus is more liberating than you think. He surrendered his freedom so that we might know the freedom of his love. Let me just... So we've got Jonathan and Nita and Rod. Uh, obviously has given you quite a lot of content, but you might have questions that are kind of coming back from that, but also other questions that you've been feeding in as we've been um, going through this morning's uh, conversation topic. So the conversation topic is all about what about choice, and uh, we're going to get straight on with the questions. So the first question that you've sent in is going to come up here, and this would have, this would have been sent in within the last few minutes. Um, so, what does Christ's given freedom look like in real life? Most Christians I know are still enslaved by sin, pain, depression, sickness, etc. Oh dear, are we, are we really that? Are we really that bad a bunch? Um, okay, what does Christ-given freedom look like in real life? Most Christians I know are still enslaved by sin, pain, depression, sickness, etc. Who'd like to answer that question? Nita. Uh, my little nugget on this would be um, that it looks different for each person. We all have our own journeys, and I think the freedom that we, we express doesn't have a particular expression that looks like, ah, oh, yeah, that person's free. It looks like what God is doing in us, and he is creative, and he, the journey that he takes us, us on is creative in terms of giving us freedom from these things as well. And um, I know I've had times in my life when I've looked at people and I've said, look at them, look at the way they're worshipping. They must have real freedom in in Christ. And that's not necessarily true. And we can spend a lot of time looking at people and deciding and judging. But actually, freedom is what God is doing in our hearts and it looks different for each one of them. Probably doesn't quite answer the question, but that's a little start of 10. Thanks. I've had a time to think now. Uh, Um easy one um so uh, here's a thought here's a thought so because it is true you uh, and i used to think this um when i first became a christian i used to tell people this is probably wrong as well that you know you sort of become a christian and you start to sort things out and that's and that's great and it's like god's like this sort of miracle um uh, sort of washing powder that you know sorts out all your whites and makes everything wonderful and and then i realized it doesn't it it's not like that in that sense it's it's actually a relationship you're entering. You're not buying washing powder. You're, you're entering a relationship. And just like when I was born, I was free, um, but I was in a relationship with my parents um, who freed me. And they then guided me, and I did all sorts of wrong things, which I won't go into now. But, um, oh, go on, Jonathan. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so it didn't, make me, it didn't make me perfect, but it did, it did bring me in a relationship where I could find rules and boundaries and I was guided it was a and it was a relationship it wasn't a set of rules of following so that's and that's what I find in my in my Christian life I I am free uh, not because I do things and there are many non-Christians I know who are far better than me amazing people I know who do things just incredible stuff um, uh, incredible loving things they do and and I realize that's not the truth of Christianity it's not but what God does is he enables me to become more loving by loving him. Thank you. Just uh, to try and um, add to that a little bit. Um, I think that saying that we're free 
doesn't mean that we're then free from all the, the baggage that we have and all the things that we wrestle with. That would actually be the, uh, the culmination of our culture's view of freedom, that we're free to do whatever we like. Uh, actually, Christian freedom is that um, uh, those things actually don't have to define us. They don't have to restrict us and, and, and bring us down because actually God has set us free because of what he has done for us. So it's not uh, a lifestyle that we need to try and live into or press into because we'll never succeed. We'll always disappoint. And if those things define us, uh, then we will always be enslaved by them. And so for me, f Christian freedom comes from every day believing the truth of the gospel that Jesus has done everything that needs to be done to make us right with God. And then whatever sin I commit, however many habits I'm still wrestling with, they don't define me anymore. You know, I, I'm forgiven. I've been set free. I, I can change. And, uh, and I, can, I can know God. And uh, for me, that's, that's a completely different understanding of freedom. Thank you. Uh, we've got another question. Let's move on to the next one because um, I think it's quite a few. Don't some Christians use the idea of freedom, freedom to suit their selfish desires? Yes. <laughs> um, You'd like yeah. to expand on that answer? Uh, uh, well, yes, I would. Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, yes, yes, I do. Uh, I, um, I suppose that's because we don't always follow God. We sometimes use God as an excuse uh, for things and uh, why we we need to constantly come back to him just because we've had a just we've had a thought it doesn't mean it's necessary from God and back to I suppose we all we all sin and we're we're on a, a journey to um, uh, discover what God means in our life and that involves a lot of listening I think sometimes we you know we use this um, to the question. Um, uh, suiting your own selfish desires which means a sort of act of doing something i think sometimes we do do things more than listen and if we listen to god more and try to pray study the bible get along to church and meet christians be with them you know we um we maybe we wouldn't be doing the do selfish desires Anybody got anything to add? Um, I haven't really thought very well, but I'm thinking of um, that passage at the end of Galatians that talks about the Spirit giving life and, um, and living out of the Spirit rather than living out of the flesh. And the sense of living out of the flesh, i.e. fulfilling those selfish desires, is enslavement. And when we use these, um, the amazing... Thing that grace is to kind of let ourselves off the hook all the time we pretend it's freedom but it's actually just letting ourselves to continue to be enslaved by our selfish desires by our flesh and actually the f freedom is found when we are in relationship with God and we we have his spirit in us and on us and around us and we are living out of the impulse of that spirit rather than the impulse of the flesh and it can, it can look to people like we're, we're being restricted and we're deciding not to do a certain thing, but actually that can come from a real place of freedom when we're no longer enslaved to whatever that sin is. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's get another question because um, we've not got a huge amount of time. How do you discern what absolute faith is with Christianity? What are the non-negotiables? What are the non-negotiables? In a minute. In a minute. If you please, no Rod. problem. Um, hmm. Where, if I'm preparing somebody for baptism, I tend to look around, uh, kind of explore the identity of God, in particular the, the person of Jesus Christ, because I think if you don't understand who Jesus is, uh, then none of this will make any sense whatsoever. Um, and then I think I tend to look at uh, what it is he has done for us, uh, both 
by becoming a human being, living the perfect life for us, uh, dying in our place on the cross, uh, being raised to new life and, uh, send, and, and ascending to the right hand of the Father and, and sending us the Holy Spirit. So that, that, that's human destiny. And I think when you be, everything is all about Jesus in that sense, I think, and, um, uh, you know, and, and God sending Jesus. Uh, he reveals himself in Jesus. So I think that's the kernel. Okay, I think you've answered that very well. I think you've basically, well, the answer to the question is you discern what absolute faith is, what the absolute non-negotiables are by asking, is this about Jesus? Is this an issue that, to do with the person and the work of Jesus Christ? Um, and that's, and that's the, the central thing. Okay, um, one or two more questions. And do keep them kind of coming as well if you're, uh, as you kind of engage with the conversation. Um, I think the easiest way is to do it by text. Um, uh, rather than passing the mic around to everybody. But uh, here's the question. Surely every message Jesus spoke was a power play. Rod, you talked about power plays a few times in, in your talk. Um, so another person texted in as well, asking, what do you mean? What, can you just help us to understand what power play is, what this concept of power play is? So uh, if you'd just like to clarify that. Yeah, okay. Um, I think truth can be wielded uh, for a number of purposes, and it can be wielded as a weapon. Um, and so you can use it to shore up your own position, to, uh, to justify uh, your own views. You can use it to justify uh, the, group, your, your, the group that you're part of. Uh, you can use truth to put down others. Um, and, uh, and really, that's most of the debates that uh, Jesus had with the Pharisees and Sadducees were precisely about that. So they made particular claims about God um, and his law that excluded those who didn't agree with them, uh, including Jesus. <laughs> and, uh, and Jesus subverted those power plays uh, with uh, the parables that he told. Um, so uh, he's, he's dealing in power uh, but I think he's not claiming power for himself. Uh, and I think um, that is most obvious um, on the cross. You know, so he's, you know, he, 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 he says to his disciples, you're going to um, take up your cross to follow me. Um, he, when, when they say, can we be at your right hand? He says to them, no, that's, you know, that's not appropriate. We're not lording it over people. Um, he says, and, and then he says, you know, it, I, angels could come to my aid, to my rescue, but whether it is uh, at Gethsemane uh, or when he's arrested or at his trial or on the cross, he simply says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And, uh, and that truth is anything but a power play. Thank you. Okay, time for one more question. So, sorry if you didn't get an opportunity to have your question answered. It's just purely an issue of timing. How is it possible to begin making this message heard when the freedom as choice message is so ingrained in culture? Nita or Jonathan? I think uh, a public intellectual, as Jonathan is in the... And, 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 and indeed Nita is. <laughs> okay. Um, how is it possible? Um, by uh, getting out there and living life and, uh, and being in our community. I think it's as simple and as difficult as that. Um, in terms of, sorry, jump back to a question before I think about what the absolute truth and support. And one thing that struck me was what Jesus said when people said, oh, what, what are all these laws we're meant to be following? You know, one of the most important laws. And Jesus said, well, the most important one is to love the Lord your God. And the second most important one is to love your neighbor. And I, I think we often find it so difficult. We think, oh, what can I do to tell someone about all this important truth of God? And, and, and is that, you know, the most important thing is, is talk to God um, and listen to him, have a conversation with him. And, um, and the second most important thing you can do is go out to your neighbors and just love them uh, with a selfless love that you have around them. And that is an immense freedom we have that you can share with everyone around you and I know when you've been loved it knocks your socks off and uh, you know we, we sometimes miss doing that with people we think we've got to have some argument or tell them explain them in a certain way the best way you can explain it is is through what God tells us to do thank you um, can we give these guys a round of applause <laughs> that was great